Hello there. People have a very unhealthy relationship with the desire, and two of the most unhealthy aspects of that relationship are our continual inability to admit to what we want, and also our unwillingness to go directly for what we want. We have been raised with the idea that some things are okay to want, like a reliable job, or kids, or dinner, or a raise, or a wife. While other things are not okay to want, like fame, power, lots of money, or a sexy girlfriend. Obviously, based on what culture or family or religion you are brought up in, what you are allowed to want is going to be different from person to person. But in our current society, we risk a lot socially by wanting what we want and by admitting to it. For example, somebody might want to be a millionaire because of the abundance that that will bring. But in today's society, we see that person as someone who has the wrong set of priorities, as materialistic. Or, for example, we might want significance or fame. And we would think in society that that's an inappropriate thing to want because it means that somebody is self-centered and shallow. Another example is that somebody might be raised poor in a family that doesn't believe it's possible to hold a position within society that is high in status. So if their child, say, wants to be a politician, they're discouraged from that out of the idea that it's going to automatically mean failure. So that particular child has to suppress and deny and disown that particular need and go into the family business or pick a job in the service industry. Or a person might be born to a rich family where there's an expectation that he or she choose a career that is seen as a high status. But the person might truly desire to join a nonprofit group and travel the world. Because the family finds this desire unacceptable, the person must deny that aspect of themselves and conform for the sake of approval. We have to be seen as good to maintain social favor and thus love. And we must maintain love to survive. And so we do what we do with all other unacceptable aspects of ourself. We banish it to the subconscious. We deny, suppress, reject, and disown those desires. They do not go away. They simply take up residence in the subconscious mind. We still make decisions because of those desires, and we still go after those desires, but we take detours to do it, and we don't really know why we are doing it. Desires that are suppressed in the subconscious mind become compulsions, and that is when our desires become dangerous to us. Let's get this out of the way up front. It is impossible to unwant something that you want. It is also impossible to want something that you want less. So we're put in a rather uncomfortable position. If we can't unwant something, we want it, but it's not okay to want it, what are we going to do? We're going to make a choice. The choice is that we either banish it from our awareness completely and we conform to what other people think we should want by dying to ourself and dying to our desires, or we would take another direction, which is that we don't admit to it, we banish it to the subconscious, but we try to still get what we want. We go about getting it in covert, passive-aggressive, roundabout ways. If we are confronted about our true desires or true priorities, we become defensive and deny it. After all, we can't maintain a positive self-view and want those things. It is in fact quite damaging to not admit to what you want and to not go directly for what you want. Our lives will run so far off course if we do that. Also, our subconscious mind does a very poor job of running the show and a much better job of ruining it. Now, before you go about your life thinking that this particular technique of admitting to what you want and going straight for it is an adorable, albeit trite, self-help technique, consider this. If Adolf Hitler could have admitted that what he truly wanted was a sense of empowerment, a sense of belonging, in a sense of safety, the entire Nazi regime would not have occurred. When we feel powerless and alone and betrayed, like Hitler did during his childhood and also during World War I, but we cannot admit to our insecurities and vulnerabilities and wounds, the subconscious mind has to try to get our needs met in any way it can. Leadership gave Hitler that sense of empowerment. Being a part of a group, which of course we know was named the Nazis, gave Hitler a sense of belonging, getting rid of the Jews, whom he had lifelong conflict with and whom he felt betrayed him and his country during World War I, made him feel safer. If we are unwilling to admit to what we really want, we may go about getting it in ways that are harmful to us and harmful to the world as well. 
For example, financial desperation aside, most prostitutes want to be valued. Their self-worth is so low that the only value they feel they have is their sexuality. So they have sex with strangers, despite the risk that they can feel that brief feeling of being valued for the only thing they feel has value. Here's another example. A person loves authority and loves to be the center of attention. They think it's not okay to admit to that. So they go into a career where they get both of those things, but they don't have to admit to what they actually like about it. Like politics. Really, they hate politics itself. They don't really care about legislation or about taking care of people's rights. They just want to be in a position of authority where they are the center of attention. They subsequently go on to damage people's lives because they never cared about those things in the first place. If they would have been willing to admit to what they wanted, they could have found a job that really had nothing to do with legislation or taking care of other people's best interests. It would have made them happy. Also, the political position could have been left to someone who actually does like legislation and who actually does get a rush out of representing other people's best interests. We are often concerned about what other people want. We don't think that it's right to want those things or that it will serve them to want those things. We might even think that by wanting those things and going for it, they're going to get really hurt. But we have to admit to the fact that we're never going to be able to actually talk them into not wanting what they want. It's in fact a much smarter decision to just help them in every way we can to get what it is that they want. We can't, of course, do this in a begrudging way because that's just disapproval. But if we can really approve of people going for what they want and getting to that new point of perspective of having that thing, then we would understand that the minute that they have what they want, their perspective shifts. Anytime we set ourselves a goal, something we want, you can think of that like a platform. Once we reach that platform, the view is different from there, and it gives rise to brand new desires. The person who wants to be a millionaire and is willing to put relationships second to money is more likely to put people first after he achieves his millions. If we try to get him to put relationships first when what his true desire is is money, we will spend years with a resentful person who never makes relationships his number one priority. We have this idea that we have to deny our needs or not let ourselves get them. It's almost like don't feed the wolf because we have this idea that if we feed a need, it's going to be a bottomless pit. There will be no end and nothing's ever going to be good enough. But what if we looked at needs and wants another way? Almost like you'd look at a cup. If the cup is empty, maybe if you fill the cup, it'll be full. Imagine that by meeting a need or want, the need or want might actually be met, and so the person might actually develop different needs and wants. To understand what I mean by this, let's take a look at an analogy which involves a key ingredient versus a secondary ingredient. Let's say that I had a craving for salt, but I didn't allow myself to go just get salt. I may look for foods where salt is an ingredient, but I would never get enough salt because I'm continually chasing salt in a roundabout way. I have to get it through other things that I'm eating. If I let myself go straight for salt, I would probably start craving something else. The crux of the matter is that we as people have essentially put a leash on ourselves and a leash on each other. We do not let ourselves run in the direction of what we truly want. We do not let other people run in the direction of what they truly want. And people who are on a leash have no other option than to run sideways. We have got to take the leash off. We've got to be brave enough to admit to what it is that we truly want and brave enough to go for it. It is so refreshing and freeing to just stop trying to suppress, deny, and disown the things that we really want out of fear. So today I'm going to ask you to take some very crucial steps. I'm going to ask you to let yourself off the leash and go in the direction of your freedom. Step number one, admit to what you really want. What are you ashamed to admit that you want? Two, admit to why you want that particular thing. What is it exactly that you like about that thing? The why about wanting something actually tells us more about what we actually want than anything else does. Three, ask yourself why it is wrong to want that thing. Is it bad or wrong to want that particular thing? Why? Why not? If you have been influenced by someone else to think that it's wrong or bad to want that thing, why did they hold that opinion? What were they afraid would be the outcome of wanting that thing? Four, question the flip side of that desire. What is this desire telling me that I absolutely know that I don't want? Another way to discover this is to ask yourself, what am I afraid will happen if I don't get this thing that I want? 
For example, if I'm ashamed that I want fame because I want significance, I may be afraid of insignificance. If we know why we think, it isn't okay to want certain things, and what we are trying to avoid by going for what we want. We can then alter our perspective about those beliefs, and start to release resistance, and heal those wounds. 5. Pick at least one person to admit this desire to, and admit it to them. Come out of the closet. 6. Ask yourself, how am I holding myself back from this thing that I want right now in my life? How am I going about getting those things in roundabout ways instead of in straightforward ways? 7. Ask what steps you could take, right here and now in your life, to go straight for what you want, to simplify the process so that you're no longer going about it in roundabout ways. What would you do differently? 8. Take those steps. If we want something desperately, it's because we have so much resistance to the idea of not getting it. We feel powerless to getting it. So we need to release resistance. Hardly anything in this universe is more powerful than the vibration of a clear desire with no resistance to what is unwanted on the other side of it. If we are willing to admit to our actual desires, the universe is ten times more likely to provide us with opportunities to actually meet those desires, where those desires are actually the main dish instead of the side dish. If we are willing to admit to what we want and go straight for it, we also give other people permission to go for what they want. The result is a much healthier society that's also a lot happier. The result is our wounds are healed much quicker. Our expansion happens much quicker. We are living from a space of authenticity instead of pretense. So do yourself a favor and let yourself off of that leash. I promise you, you will never look back. And if you do look back, it will only be to admire or reminisce on what a good idea it really was. Have a good week.